Okay, Jia, Assalamu alaikum. This is our second lecture after the closures that took place because of the COVID-19. Uh, just to recap, in the past lecture, we talked about basically the different type of philosophies and uh, some basic concepts about research. And in this lecture, we're going to uh, move forward with some additional topics and I'll be clarifying to you uh, the nature of the research and some uh, other concepts uh, regarding the different types of research that exist, right? So uh, we talked about research uh, in the last lecture. And if you remember, I mentioned to you that research is a systematic process through which we uh, go through a process of discovery and we try to come up with solutions or answers to particular type of uh, research questions. Right? So uh, for research to take place, there's going to be uh, this tremendous degree of involvement uh, as far as collection of data is concerned. And then once the data is collected, that data has to be interpreted somehow. And uh, you have to decide then what to do with it, right? So number one, you have to come up with a research problem. Then you have to uh, do the literature review. Driven by that research problem, then you're going to uh, pose your research questions. Uh, and then once you have your research questions, you decide upon your methodology. And once you have decided upon the methodology, you're going to move forward and you're going to start collecting your uh, data and then you're going to interpret that data uh, later on. Right? So all of this has to be thought about very, very clearly before the research process begins, because if you find yourself in this uh, condition, uh, wondering uh, the, what I should be doing with my data, then clearly you're not doing research in the right way, right? So every single thing has to be thought out beforehand. Uh, and so to speak, you must have a plan A in mind that this is what I'll do. And if that plan cannot materialize, then you should also have a plan B in your mind as well, uh, which would be the alternate course of action that you're going to take when conducting your research, right? So that is something that we normally call the research design. But we should have a very thorough research design in place before we go into the field and start collecting our data. Uh, but the research design requires the formulation of research questions, a framework, uh, and a selection of your methodology and methods before that, right? So research involves then, therefore, collection of data interpreting the information that you're going to get and then how you are going to present that information. Now, before we uh, move forward with these concepts even more, we have to understand this idea of management research, uh, which is a bit different than the type of research that takes place in, uh, for example, uh, social sciences, purely in sociology and so forth, uh, or anthropology and uh, all these disciplines. Uh, and also management research is significantly uh, different than the research that takes place in the physical sci uh, sciences, right? Now, what happens in the uh, physical sciences is that you have to be an expert in a particular domain, and only then can you go ahead and conduct that research. So, for example, if you don't know anything about physics, how are you going to go and conduct research on physics? At the same time, if you're not good in biology, can you possibly conduct a biological uh, research study? Right. So uh, that means that these disciplines require that the person conducting the research in these disciplines should have a level of expertise. Right. But what makes management research different is that it's not exclusive to managers. Right. Uh, management research is something that you and I, as normal uh, people living in society are practicing on a day-to-day -day basis. How are we practicing management research? Uh, we're practicing it in the sense that we're trying to make sense of what is happening around us and what is taking place around us. And that could be uh, dealing with our personal lives in general, or it could be uh, dealing with our organizational lives as, as professionals. Right? So all this time, uh, asking this question, uh, of what is taking place and why is it happening and what am I to do about it is basically uh, a form of, of conducting a research study uh, where you're trying to make sense of your environment. Right? So we safely can uh, uh, 
agree to the suggestion that management research is not basically an exclusive domain of experts, rather uh, people living in normal lives have something to do with management research per se, right? Now, what managers have to do with this uh, dynamic is that managers are basically paid, uh, and they're paid quite hefty salaries. Uh, and they are paid these big salaries because uh, they do something for the organizations, which is that there's this tremendous amount of disorder and chaos that exists around this company, and somehow this manager has to make sense out of this chaos and to bring some order to the dynamic, right? Uh, and at the same time, the manager is having to decide what uh, the organization's next course of action is going to be. So as an example, if you can take... Um, you know, for example, the Anglo Corporation or uh, Honda Corporation of Pakistan, the senior managers in these companies are getting paid more than 40 lakh rupees per month. And why did they get paid this amount of money is because they have to make sense of this tremendous amount of disorder that exists around their companies and they have to make sense of it. Right? Now, this way, uh, by, by making sense out of what is going on, these management researchers are trying to understand uh, the nature of management that they have to exercise, uh, and they also have to understand the problem uh, and basically create a better understanding of the work that they have to do in their, their organization, right? So this uh, covers point one, which is going to be uh, the first perspective that we have about management research. Now, the second perspective that we have about management research is that there has been, uh, in the past, this, this tremendous focus upon quantitative research, per se, right? And uh, what that means is that people have uh, taken this idea very, very seriously uh, that quantitative research is the best way of conducting research. And this has to do with uh, this prevalence of quantitative research in uh, the physical sciences, which took uh, sort of started in, in the early 1600s and went on up until uh, the 1930s or so, right? So for a good three, 400 years, this uh, focus upon qualitative research has been there. So because of that, we find that there's this tremendous uh, focus upon describing things, coding things, counting events, and so forth. And this is how we have taken management research and understood it to be in, in, in this way, right? That it is quantitative in nature. Uh, but that's not really true because there are now also uh, qualitative research studies uh, possible as well. And the qualitative research study is going to take a, a different stance towards this management research. Uh, and the concern is not going to be about describing and coding and counting things, rather uh, it's going to be a concern about creating explanations uh, that somehow provide um, in-depth explanations of why something is taking place and what consequence uh, that those choices are going to have for us in the future, right? So we've got the uh, qualitative research flavor uh, inside management research, and you also have the quantitative research flavor as well. Now, the philosophical uh, bit that we talked about in briefly in the last lecture, is something that we cannot avoid, right? So what we find that in management research, there's this tremendous uh, role that is played by the philosophical underpinnings that we have. Now, it's, it's another thing to say that this philosophical idea is something that doesn't exist in, in the forefront of the research, rather it resides more towards the back end of the research, right? So what that implies is that there is going to be some sort of a philosophy that drives your research study, but it's not going to be in your face, so to speak. So what does the philosophy have to do in this picture is that it drives basically the research study that you have, uh, it drives the nature of the questions that you're asking, and uh, definitely is going to drive the nature of the uh, interpretation that you're going to have and then the findings that you're going to come up with, right? So having said that, uh, for example, uh, this COVID-19 uh, 
pandemic that we have around us, it is, uh, you know, as we see in the newspapers, they keep telling us that it has uh, this tremendous uh, effect upon our economy. So one way of conducting the research study is to look at the economy and to try to understand the consequences that COVID-19 is having upon the economy. But uh, are we going to look at each individual business and say, well, this is how COVID has affected uh, each individual business, or are we more likely to come up with some so here's how the sector has been affected, or here's how the economy has been affected. So safe to say that management research normally looks at the overall picture rather than looking at one uh, specific individual entity and suggesting some sort of result about it. So we come up with this aggregation of, of numbers and aggregation findings about uh, sectors and industries together. Right? Um, now, philosophically, this is a very quantitative science. And in that case, we're saying, well, what has been the quantifiable effect of COVID-19 upon a particular sector or industry? But at the same time, we may have uh, philosophically come up for a subjectivist idea. And if we have done that, in that case, it doesn't make sense to look at these organizations and firms in their entirety, rather than we have to look at them individually. So the concern changes in that case, right? So the concern is now not going to be about the overall uh, implication of COVID-19 on, on businesses, rather it's going to be a concern that focuses upon uh, how these individual uh, managers and other members of the organizations are behaving, and this uh, ceaseless number of negotiations that are taking place within that organization, and that organization dealing with the government and dealing with their competitors and so forth. So your research study could focus upon that perspective specifically as well. So in that case, we're not going to get uh, generalized findings that apply to the overall industry, Rather, we are going to get more details about how a few organizations function within this uh, economic turmoil that we're facing now. Right? So uh, the philosophical underpinnings that we have are going to be driving both of these cases. And which one that we follow is going to completely depend upon the stance, the philosophical stance that we uh, took at the beginning of the study. Now, at the same time, there is this other concern as well, which is a political concern, so to speak, or uh, you could say that it is a ethical concern uh, that exists. And these are difficult to escape. Right? So how is the political concern? Well, the political concern is that we have to realize that the type of individuals that we are going to collect data from are political uh, creatures in the society. Everybody is a political creature because they're concerned about their past, they're concerned about the present, they're concerned about the future. So everybody is, is uh, playing the, the, the game of politics. And managers and organizations are tremendously powerful individuals because they are governing and managing different individuals that exist within their organization. So they are going to have political motives uh, that they would possess political models in the sense that they would like to uh, safeguard the shortcomings that they uh, have. They would like to uh, divulge, uh, divulge certain information and not uh, divulge other types of information. So uh, the reason that they want to keep certain information secret is because they don't want others to find out about it or they don't want their competitors to know about what they're doing or what they're planning. They don't want the government to figure out how they are trying to save on, on taxes and so forth, right? So uh, the political pressure is going to be existing in, in uh, these management types of scenarios. So what consequence does that have for you as an individual who is interested in, in conducting managerial research is that you may have problems gaining access to the organization uh, and more so gaining access to the relevant type of data in these organizations. Right? So you have to keep that in mind that uh, organizational managers are political creatures and they would like to prevent certain information from being divulged. So they are going to restrict your access. Now, similarly, there's, uh, there's this ethical concern as well, which is that what if you find certain information uh, 
uh, which could be uh, used out of a context somehow and that can detriment or damage the, um, the, the basically the, uh, the standing of the company uh, in, in society so how should you be divulging this information so there's these ethical dilemmas as well right so the philosophical considerations are not just the paradigms are not just concerned about the way that you're going to conduct the research or the way that you're going to pose the questions of your research study and so forth, but they also have to uh, deal with the pragmatic issues of, of gaining access to our organizations and, and capturing uh, data from there. And what kind of things can you uh, do with that data? What kind of information can you divulge? Right? Uh, so for example, Another concern would be that, you know, uh, should you be naming an organization uh, in your research study? Uh, now, it's an important question because, uh, you know, what difference would it make if you name the company versus if you were to hide the name of the company and use some sort of a code for that company? Well, uh, as a researcher, you have to weigh out these options uh, somehow, and you have to gain consent of, of the person from whom you are collecting information as to whether they're going to allow you to use the name of their company and make it apparent for everybody. Versus if, if they tell you that, no, don't, don't name my company, rather uh, keep it secretive. So the question then is, is that going to somehow diminish the findings uh, or reduce the, uh, the uh, the validity and the importance of the finding that you're going to have. So this is also a concern that you may have in your mind, right? So, uh, for example, if somebody tells you, don't name my company, rather use a code for it, right? Uh, you may do that, but uh, are, you, are you really able to hide that company well? And what if your reader, uh, you know, puts the devil of brain power into it? Can they decipher which organization or which entity you're talking about? So, for example, what if you're talking about a research study um, and you decide not to name it uh, and you say, well, I'm talking about Project X, right? Uh, but you still have to describe that project. What if you the project is about this mass transit level type of a setup that's taking place in uh, the, the city of Peshawar and Khyber Pakhukwa. So you may keep calling it Project X, but if somebody thinks a little bit about it, they can easily figure out that you're talking about the BRT project. So have you really hidden it and has that created any benefit or has it sort of diminished uh, the quality of your findings in any way? So these are ethical concerns that we have to keep in mind and some sort of way, uh, way around these has to be found out, right? So there's this philosophical underpinning that, that exists, uh, both at the level of the paradigms, the ontologies, the epistemologies, and what have you, and also at the level of the ethics and politics and all the collection of data, interpretation of data, and uh, making your findings relevant, right? So we have to keep that in, in the back of our mind. Now, in order to conduct a level uh, of research at, at the managerial level, uh, we have to sort of understand a little bit of, about this concept of management uh, and where it has come from. Right? So if we pick up on uh, different types of books and so forth about management, we find that really intense level of work on management begins somewhere in the early 1910. And that's when we find this tremendous amount of writing and research and uh, facts about management coming up in front of us and the role of the manager and the uh, idea of what the firm should be doing and uh, you know the, the maximizing of the shareholder wealth type of concept comes from uh, Robert Coase's theory of the firm and so forth. Right? So we find that most of this writing is centered towards the early 1900s. Right? But that doesn't mean that management research hasn't existed or, um, you know, if, if you look around you, you, you find a lot of different types of uh, things that people have created and built and those people have, have ceased to exist and we don't know much about these people or we know something, or a little bit about these people, uh, perhaps their languages are dead now, we don't, uh, 
you know, nobody speaks those languages anymore, for example, Latin or, or the languages spoken by uh, the ancient Egyptians when the pharaohs and those people were around, right? So um, that society has sort of ceased to exist for us. But uh, that doesn't mean what they did um, has also ceased to exist. For example, if, if you think about the pyramids of Giza, or if you think about the Great Wall of China, or if you think about the uh, other type of pyramids that were built by the Mayans and the Aztecs and so forth. So those people, you know, they, they did, of course, do management uh, because imagine this, this massive level of uh, construction that they were going through. That must have uh, required this tremendous amount of coordination and control to be there. Now, the idea is, is, is slightly different than what we do now, which is that the access to resources and the control or the, the resources is different. I mean, the, the ownership of these resources is different, but that doesn't mean that management did not exist back then. You know, I'm, I'm sure uh, Ferron making all those slaves uh, work in order to build the pyramids would have required this tremendous amount of uh, coordination and control. Uh, the, the Chinese building the Great Wall of China would have required this tremendous amount of coordination and control. Right? So we can agree to this, that uh, management by itself is not a new idea, it's quite an old idea and it has existed for a long, long, long time. Uh, now, there's an example, we've got this uh, uh, person named Mancuse uh, from 372 to 289 BC. Uh, it's a Chinese uh, uh, philosopher. Uh, the actual pronunciation is Mangzi. Mancuse is sort of the Latinized pronunciation of his name. Uh, so around 2000 years ago, this person was talking about systems and models and uh, this idea of division of labor and so forth. So clearly, this, these people were practicing some type of management. Uh, it's another idea that, you know, what they talked about or what they wrote about may have been forgotten about uh, by us for a long period of time. But somehow these ideas resurfaced later on. Right? And Meng Zee's ideas uh, about the division of labor resurfaced uh, around 2,000 years later uh, in, in the 1900s that we started applying these, right? Um, so the, some of the concepts of management are not new to us, right? Now, management, you know, is, is this new type of an idea, uh, if, if we take it as a new idea, because we start thinking in, in different terms about it, right? Uh, you know, Al Alfred P. Chandler talks about this idea of the visible hand as opposed to the invisible hand uh, given to us by Adam Smith. And Chandler is of the view that the invisible hand vanished when the visible hand became apparent. So what is he talking about? Well, he is talking about this uh, role of the manager and the profession of the manager and the position of the manager coming into the company. Right? So management becomes this cadre. It becomes this collection of people who have this title manager across their chest and they've got the right to manage people and they've got the right to re use resources in the company uh, and so forth. So one idea is that management uh, is now the a group of people or a collection of people. So we can say as a cadre of people, right? They have a right to uh, apply management, they have a right to control people, uh, and they, they have some sort of a similar mindset or a similar goal as long as they belong to an organization. And that mindset of that goal comes uh, from the top level of the organization or from the management series that we have. So one idea is that manager, uh, people in the management cadre could hold this view that uh, the purpose of their uh, firm is to maximize the shareholder wealth. So all the managers in that company are going to agree to that idea and this is how they're going to uh, pursue their management. Right? Um, now the term management uh, is reserved for a particular uh, layer of 
the organization and above, uh, certain people below that layer are not considered to be managers. So for example, the first line uh, supervisors uh, would normally be called as supervisors rather than managers. Uh, anybody above the line manager or the supervisor layer was going to be in the management uh, category, right? So management is a term reserved for somebody above the supervisor layer. Now, certain uh, developments have taken place, which is that, you know, uh, with time we move from uh, the industrialization idea of, of having a factory and machines and so forth, uh, we moved into this completely new sector of the economy, uh, which is known as the service sector. Right? So the growth of the service sector has uh, changed the way that organizations are uh, structured. Um, and, and the assembly line uh, format would call these tall uh, or deep hierarchies and the distance between the, the owner and the worker is, is tremendously large. But with the service sector, there's been this shrinking, right? And we've gone towards something called flatter hierarchies or, or flatter organizations, right? Um, where the stress has changed upon uh, people working in these organizations um, and stress has now focused upon commitment right? and we're concerned about people and their commitment to the organization. Um, and we find many studies that sort of adhere to this concept where we're concerned about whether you know employees are going to leave the organization or not, are they committed to stay with us? And then we can exercise different types of techniques to increase commitment. We can give rewards and we can uh, promise you know future progressions or career paths and trainings and so forth in order to increase the commitment of the people so that they don't leave the organization. There's been this focus upon, um, you know, sort of organization silence and uh, making people more uh, vocal and, and providing their opinions and so forth. So we don't want now uh, employees to be like robots. We want them to be actually committed and participative in the organization. Right? Um, at the same time, the way that, you know, business people are educated, uh, there's been this focus upon uh, skill sets, right? So now uh, one person is not going to say that, well, I'm just here as an accountant and my only skill set is going to be accounting. They have to know something about finance. They have to know something about research and development. They have to have skills in marketing and they have to have skills in operational uh, type of activities and development type of activities and so forth, right? So the teams are now multi-skilled in these uh, service sectors. Um, and there's this minimization of status. Right? Uh, we find, for example, in Intel, Intel Corporation that the chief executive of Intel, uh, which is a multi billion dollar company, doesn't have a separate office. Rather, he sits just like everybody else in a cubicle type of an environment. Uh, so there's this minimum status there, and there's this concern about creating harmony and sort of democracies and organizations, right? So the service sector has, has changed the way um, from sort of a uh, autocratic organization towards more of a democratic organization, which is now more leaner and flatter in, in the structure, right? So this, uh, uh, according to Handy 1989, uh, gives rise to this idea that everyone working in an organization should work towards developing their managerial skills. Uh, and somebody cannot now claim that they're just going to be uh, technical uh, people, rather everybody has to have some level of skills and, and management, right? Now, organizational members, of course, will have to have their own technical expertise. We you're not going to escape that. So you're either going to be an engineer or an accountant or a lawyer or you know whatever have you in an organization. So you're going to have your own professional uh, and technical skills with you, but you have to quickly acquire the skills of managing money, people, and projects within these organizations. So the softer side is something that is going to become important for you as, as working uh, professionals and um, organizations. And if you're looking at collecting data, you have to also 
think in these lines as well that we're not just going to be concerned about the technical and vocational skills of the employees. We may actually be concerned about their managerial skills as well. Right? And uh, that sort of gives us this uh, other thought that managers are not just going to reside now anymore at the top level or above the supervisory level, rather, uh, you're going to have small cohorts within your organization, and there's going to be managers there as well, uh, small group level managers or project managers or small type of program managers and so forth. So we can actually be also targeting uh, departmental managers and, and these people and, and collecting data from them as well. Right? Now, uh, where does this uh, really, does this idea of the word management uh, pick up momentum, well, it picks up momentum with the uh, sort of like the industrialization that took place in the United States in the early 1900s um, and in the late 1800s. Right? So we get uh, some important figures coming out into the picture. Uh, and these people uh, talk about, you know, the role of the manager and they take on these roles in these corporations, right? specifically um, the the building of the uh, river canal system so that goods can be transported across the United States is quite important. And also building of the railroads is quite important. Right? So these are two uh, things that really happen in, in the United States that uh, drove this idea of management uh, and the use of the term uh, management in the modern terms comes to us in, uh, in the time of the industrialization that takes place there. Right? And this tremendous need arises because of this, this industrialization, which is that um, people should know how to set up businesses and run businesses, uh, and people should be entrepreneurial enough to come up with new ideas and new types and forms of businesses for us. Right? So in the 19, uh, early 1900s, late, late 1800s, we get this idea of management coming at us at, at full force, right? Now, at the same time, this uh, business school idea also generates or, or comes up uh, at us at, uh, around that time as well. And we, we find Harvard University setting up their business school and uh, taking up this analytical approach towards management uh, at that time as well. And the University of Chicago also setting up their own business schools as well. Right? So slowly and gradually with this industrialization in the US economy, uh, we also are getting uh, business schools which are now concentrating upon this idea of quantification and measurement and so forth. Right? And that is driven uh, particularly by the experiences uh, that certain people had in, in managing their own firms. And so one person that's quite famous in using their personal experiences um, and their own firm and sort of explaining those to other people and, and driving this new revolution has been uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor and his idea of scientific management. And again, he takes upon the same concept of Meng Zee and he goes towards this idea of the division of labor. And he thinks about, you know, uh, this idea of measurement and, and dictating to the worker what single steps and series of steps that worker has to take and experimenting and refining those steps basically uh, ultimately so that there is this increase in productivity and efficiency. Right? So that has been the thought that we get from uh, Taylor and his idea of scientific management. And I told you that later on we find that this concept was uh, uh, basically an, uh, a mental idea that he had and Taylor had ne never actually implemented it because uh, the scientific study that explored this in more detail found that Taylor actually was on vacation around that time with his fiance in, in France and he actually did never put these concepts into, um, into practical implementation, but nonetheless, we still accept Taylor as the father of scientific management, right? Um, and, uh, there's this other person as well around 1916, which is Henry Fayol, and his thought about you know uh, coming up with the 14 basic principles of how organizational life can be improved and and people uh, can be more happier, right? So there's breathing for and uh, you know the cadre of management and the level of management and those thoughts are also provided to us, right? So that idea uh, 
is still down to form the concept of modern management to us, right? So these are, uh, have been uh, two of the predominant thoughts that have driven uh, the beginning of, of uh, management to us, right? Then later on, uh, some other thoughts developed, which is that managers are there for a particular purpose, which is to uh, plan, to lead, to organize, to control, and, and those things, right? Uh, so the idea uh, becomes, quite dominant within management literature. And no matter which book you pick up on management, it's normally compartmentalized into these four or five sections. There's the idea of planning and organizing and staffing and leading and controlling, right? So this, this is how management has been compartmentalized. So later on in 1973, Andy Minsford comes into the picture and he says, well, is this really what happens in an organization? And this is uh, this is exactly what managers do. So he goes and he collects data from uh, certain high-level managers and spends a good three, four months with them in the field. And and he he comes back to us with his findings and he says, well, uh, to be honest, this is not what managers are doing. Uh, there are more sort of you know, sitting down and, uh, and there's this bombardment of problems and issues that are coming up in front of them. And these managers have to take uh, decisions very, very quickly. Uh, so there's not really a lot of planning, leading, organizing, and all that stuff. Uh, rather, these managers are more reflexive practitioners and they're, um, uh, you know, sort of providing knee-jerk reactions to problems and issues that arise. So if we consider Minsberg's work to be correct, and we do accept it to be correct to a great extent, so then uh, what should we do? Should we concern ourselves and, and find out answers to how managers plan or how they lead or how they control or what have you, or rather should the focus be entirely uh, Difference. So Minsberg and uh, people that accept Minsberg's ideas are uh, really, uh, you know, concerned about this concept, and they're saying, well, no, rather the focus should not be upon uh, planning and leading and organizing and so forth. Rather, management research should focus upon uh, helping managers to manage their time better and helping them to decide on things better. And so that gives rise to a completely different set of uh, researches that can be uh, conducted. Right? Now, in 1959, there was a study by Gordon and Howell, and uh, it was quite an influential study that was sponsored by the Ford Foundation. Uh, and it looked at basically um, this part of what managers uh, should be doing, uh, what kind of skill sets should these managers possess. So the uh, finding of the study were that managers should possess tremendous analytical uh, skills, right? And if you are not good analytically, uh, that is uh, a problem. Uh, but if you're good analytically, but poor in uh, dealing with people, that's not an issue. So rather, um, what should be the focus upon, you know, uh, training these people uh, uh, that would be potential managers is, is not a focus upon their managerial skills, rather the focus should be on their uh, analytical and quantitative skills. Right? So this study has been quite influential in the sense that since it came out, it changed the way that business schools uh, uh, were, were teaching and it changed the curriculum of the business schools tremendously. Right? And it gave rise to uh, these people coming out into corporations who were engineers and had engineering backgrounds, uh, so they were good at mathematics and numbers, but they had poor uh, human skills and communication skills. And the type of things that they later did uh, within these organizations were instrumental because they created a lot of damage. Uh, you know, you may have heard of this term called business process re-engineering, right? So it's another way of saying, you know, let's get rid of people and make uh, the organization leaner. Because by minimizing the staff, we're going to save on money. So the quickest remedy to save a downing organization is to fire a bunch of people, right? Uh, right sizing or downsizing were other terms that were used for uh, business process re-engineering. BPR, business process re-engineering, BPR is a later term, but 
downsizing got replaced by right sizing and not that got replaced by business process reengineering. So the numbers mattered, but what did not matter for these people were the consequences of their actions upon families and individuals and their psychological and physical well-being, right? So this, this has been instrumental this paper by Gordon and Howell uh, and it has given rise to disciplines like operations research and um, uh, finance and uh, marketing and so forth where the concern has less been upon on the people and more upon uh, the quantification of facts right now the 1960s then uh, sort of takes on this idea and it also takes on this other idea as well uh, that you know we have to help the managers in, in making better decisions. So we find the 1960s to have a prevalence of the use of uh, decision theory, uh, of models and simulations and quantification and so forth. And we find a lot of the business curricula uh, reflecting this uh, type of a focus of, again. Right? So uh, now the question becomes, uh, should we focus our research upon uh, managers as, as people who do management or should we focus focus upon management as a process uh, and, and try to figure out how management is done right so as a researcher we start thinking in these lines uh, as to are, are we concerned about uh, one thing or are we concerned about the other right uh, so we will explore this uh, idea of it later as well. Right? Now, of course, there has been um, attacks that have taken place regarding the different stances that we have had about management and, and how it, uh, research may be conducted in, in that, right? So for example, there's, there's uh, the classical management or modern management. So some people have, have, have taken an attack on that and said, well, you know, this is rubbish and this is how things uh, ought not to be. So from myths where uh, these are about Stuart and about Porter. Uh, so all these are people who, who take a stab at classical management and say, well, the analytical perspective is, is good, but has it actually done anything useful for us? So we find that it hasn't, so uh, we shouldn't be pursuing it uh, further. Um, this is an academic attack, right? And there's been other attacks from uh, the side of the industry and, and the practitioners working in industry as consultants. Uh, and they have also taken an, an attack at this uh, analytical perspective. Uh, people like Livingston and Hayes and uh, Abernathy, the, all these people are again also of the view that the quantification idea doesn't really work, right? So we're now concerned about the managerial process of planning, organizing, leading, controlling, and so forth. And we know that that doesn't work. And we're also concerned about the excess use of decision theory and the use of models and simulations. And we're uh, finding that attacks are existing that these don't work uh, either, right? So then the question is, what uh, does work and what uh, ought we to be doing, right? So these are not important questions that we have to have in a Mind, right? Now, academia in itself sort of uh, listens to both of these people like Minsberg uh, and people like Abernathy and Livingston. Uh, academia listens to them and academia acknowledges that they, these people are correct, but academia is quite slow in, in sort of reciprocating uh, and changing themselves. And what is the reason that that uh, uh, change is so slow and it doesn't happen very rapidly? So. It's because um, the business schools have this tremendous amount of inertia, right? There's more than uh, four or 500,000 people coming out with MBA degrees, and there's you know, hundreds and thousands of business schools across the world, and hundreds and thousands of people coming up with management degrees. So, of course, once you learn something, that is something that you're going to, uh, you know, sort of protect and say, well, this is how things are, so I'm not going to uh, get rid of it altogether, and this is how I'm going to continue to do management. And so academia acknowledges that this is uh, taking place, but it is slow and changing because uh, management schools are producing a lot of uh, different uh, business people, and they are still adhering to most of the curriculum that was laid down in the early 1960s and, and later on in the 1970s and 80s. So what has happened in the 
uh, 70s and 80s is, is this uh, excess use of, of computers, which has again led to the use of different types of tools and techniques, which requires uh, the use of computers, right? So more simulations and more modeling have come into the picture. Now, management research, um, as I suggested earlier, is, is distinct. It's not the same as research in other fields, right? So what makes this management research distinctive? Well, what makes this uh, distinctive is the type of people that exercise management, right? So for example, um, if I'm a person who's managing uh, a group of people, uh, so am I you know, distant and far away from sociology and uh, understanding how small groups of individual focuses and works? So I can't get rid of sociology. That has to be a part of my uh, collection of skills. I should understand anthropology a little bit and, and understand how past legacies and past processes and past artifacts uh, affect the, the way that my present actions and my future outcomes are going to be. I can't get rid of economics. I, I have to understand the economy and how my company functions as a whole. And I have to understand statistics and apply uh, different tools and techniques to synthesize information. And I, I have to understand mathematics and do some addition and subtraction and so on and so forth. And so as managers, um, I'm, I'm not practicing a singular discipline. Rather, I'm, I'm practicing a discipline that borrows and steals from other disciplines. Other disciplines right? So we, we can uh, think about management uh, as, as a cross-disciplinary uh, type of an idea. So as a researcher then, management research is, is different because I don't have this singular type of uh, perspective about management. Rather, I have a cross-disciplinary type of a focus. I could take a singular focus and focus on management by itself, completely removed from statistics and economics and finance and all that, or I could take a focus upon management research as a cross-disciplinary focus, right? So of course, if I take a, uh, a focus on just the mathematical skills or the statistical skills of managers, I could conduct research on, on economics and just the anthropology that exists within organizations or just the sociological perspective, but that's, that's going to be a very singular perspective. Uh, it may be easy to publish papers, you know, that are having to deal with operations research and, you know, coming up with a new formula or a new type of uh, uh, econometric model or so forth, but is that really going to aid in uh, extending this uh, field more and making it better? Or will it be more useful uh, to have a cross-disciplinary and a multidisciplinary focus, right? So um, as a researcher, we'll find that in, in management research, we can do both. Uh, the first type is going to be easier, which means a singular focus and, and uh, coming up with research studies with that focus. The second focus is not going to be easy to do, but is going to be more uh, beneficial for us, right? So the results are going to be more useful. Number two, management research is, uh, is different than other type of researchers, such as research about physics, right? Or research on chemistry or biology, for that matter. Because in, in management research, you've got to deal with or you have to interact with managers. And as I suggested to you earlier, these managers are political entities and they exercise a lot of power within these organizations. So uh, they are not going to be able to give you a lot of time and they're not going to allow you to access uh, all the information in, in these companies. Right? So if you were lucky enough to then get access to the managers, so we have to then think about, well, what kind of data can we uh, collect from these managers? Should, should I just sort of follow these managers around for months on end and observe what they're doing? Should I sit down with these managers and do uh, endless discussions and try to figure out if something important comes out of these discussions? Or would it be better that I have a more directed type of uh, questions that I go and rapidly find answers for and get return, get out of the hair and come back to my desk and sort of analyze the data. And so management research has this flavor that it is more uh, 
structured and the more structured it is that the better uh, of where you are going to be and the better data that you're going to get. So more uh, desk research um, uh, is going to take place and the importance of the desk uh, research element is going to be more prevalent in, in management research. Uh, management research um, should also have an orientation towards action, right? Uh, we're not just going to collect data and say, well, okay, this is what we found. Rather, we have to have thought about the impact of this research uh, as, as a whole for the organization or maybe for society and so forth. So it's, it's not just going to be this lofty type of a research. Management research has uh, a lot of uh, uh, lineage towards society or action uh, and certain uh, goodness should be coming out. Right, so these are three important points that we have about management research. Now, we're moving slowly towards the closing of this lecture. Um, the idea is that uh, there's a few types of uh, research, right? Uh, one is the pure research, the other is applied research, and the third is action research. So I'll just uh, briefly talk about these uh, different types of research. Right? Now, pure research, as research that we conduct for the sake of doing the research, for the sake of pushing the boundaries of research and extending the boundaries of what we know. So that would be called as a pure research. Right? Now, we are led to believe that pure research is, uh, for the most part, theoretical in, in nature and it focuses upon theory development, uh, and it may not have any consequence as far as its practical value is concerned. Uh, but that may not really be uh, the correct understanding of that. Right? Now, why do I say that? Well, uh, if, if, if we focus upon the subtypes of, of pure research, we we'll get the sense that you know pure research is not completely like that. It lays the foundation for further consequences to, to be there, right? Uh, what we find from pure research could ultimately be used in an applied form, and it can be quite helpful in a sense, right? Now, pure research uh, is divided into uh, three types. Uh, basically, we can say that pure research results in three types of outcomes for us, right? So depending upon which category of outcome you have, you have the pure research of that type. Now, the first outcome is that you're going around uh, conducting some research in some sort of a topic of your interest, and by coincidence, you happen to discover something new. Right? So this is important to keep in mind that you went out to conduct this research for one purpose, but surprise, surprise, you encountered a new discovery, and now you have uh, something new on your hand, right? Now, how frequently does that happen? Uh, it doesn't happen very frequently, so that would perhaps not be the right way of doing a, a research study with all that you discover something because discoveries don't happen very frequently. So you may end up conducting a whole lot of research and never discover anything. Uh, so, if you, you know, uh, you can say that you may never complete your um, degree then, right? So we don't want to wait for a pure research that is completely discovery-oriented, right? So what do I mean by uh, uh, pure research that has led to a discovery when we've got the example of, uh, for example, the Hawthorne Power Plant studies, which I mentioned in, in the previous uh, study, where uh, people uh, went in, right? And for, uh, sorry, uh, um, Rotless Burger and Mayo, and uh, they they went in and collected data from individuals working in the, uh, the supply assembly line and the electrical supply room. And you know what they found out was um, that you know this idea of being uh, observed has an effect upon us, and, and human element or the human behavior has a role to play. So these, these this was a discovery. They didn't go out to discover this. It just so happened that when they started to analyze their data, uh, they, they found that there, there was something wrong. So later on, the, the, these two discoveries came out. Right? So that was a pure research that extended the boundary of, of research for us uh, through the discovery. Pure research can also come up with an invention. 
which is basically a method or technique that somebody develops to deal with a certain problem. So, for example, I've, I've got this problem, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've tailored and I've got this problem where I, I think, well, can I increase the efficiency of my people? So I start playing with, uh, you know, coming up with, uh, you know, the scientific way of doing research, and I observe well the existing phenomena. I bring certain change into it, and then I try to see if that one works or not. And if it does work, and I say, well, here's what works for me. So I have solved my problem. Uh, so that is an invention, right? So uh, pure research uh, invents uh, scientific management, or pure research uh, results in the invention of. Uh, Total quality management or business process, re engineering, or something of that nature. That person didn't really seek out to invent this. It was a result of what they were doing that this invention arose, right? Sort of like a close to the discovery, but not really uh, in that sense. Um, and also, pure research can result in a reflection. So we can think, oh, you know, uh, can we take offset special model uh, and apply it specifically to the uh, info speaking population of Peshawar and, and see if that applies here well. And if it doesn't apply, then, you know, how do we change it or make it better so it does apply? So that would be sort of a reflection based time. Right? And mostly PhD studies are of that type, which takes uh, one. Uh, idea from one context and we apply it to some other type of big context. Then we've got another type of research, which we call it as an applied research, right? Which is that, you know, somebody has a problem and they say, well, you know, Mr. University, we're going to pay you this amount of money or research group X, we're going to give you this much money, solve this problem for us, right? So for example, uh, Pizza Hut may be, uh, thinking when I've got this problem, which is that my customers are not getting their visas on time. Uh, and plus I'm wasting a lot of uh, fuel and time running around the city. So I need to reduce that somehow. So can, can you solve my problem for me and give me a solution for it? So the research is conducted particularly to solve this uh, issue or problem and then the research ceases to exist. So we call that as an applied research, right? So that is another way of doing research. Uh, and mostly uh, MPhil level or MS level researchers uh, could be focused upon this. And you may be lucky enough that somebody pays you money to uh, come up with a solution for, for the problem that they face. And at the same time, you end up getting your degree as well. Right? And the last type of uh, research that we have is also um, there, which is known as action research. And this sort of uh, uh, buys into this uh, new type of uh, idea uh, is also called a new paradigm and which is that you know research should not be done uh, just for the sake of doing research uh, research should be done with a particular uh, action of mind uh, it should lead to some sort of a positive change uh, in an organization so if we uh, adhere to the third type of research then uh, you know, the, the change process has to be incorporated into the research study. So if we're doing this third type of research, then we're doing uh, action research, which is definitely change oriented, uh, and change has to be a part of the research study. But, you know, having said that, not everybody will be allowed to do uh, research in this new paradigm of action research because you must be in a particular position, right? Uh, if, if I am in a, in a management position at my organization where I can implement a change, only then can I sanction or I can conduct a uh, action research study uh, where I can implement the actions. Right? If I am a researcher who is far removed from the organization and I'm not a part of that organization, nor do I have a sponsor who's going to allow me to implement the change or implement the change then themselves, then uh, I can't really conduct a action research study, right? So somebody has to be present in an organization as a change maker for us to implement the change, right? Um, some other terminology has also been used for this um, 
applied and pure research, which is uh, that pure research is sometimes also known as a mode one research, and applied research is also known as a mode two type of the research, right? or a type one research study versus a type two research study. So just to uh, sort of recap here, we looked at uh, how management research is not a particular domain of uh, specific experts. So that, uh, we all practice uh, management research in our day-to-day -day lives when we're making sense of our environment and what is taking place in our professional and our daily lives. Uh, management research is not purely quantitative, rather there is a qualitative uh, focus in there as well. And management research cannot be conducted without having some idea of uh, philosophy and the ontologies and epistemologies and the political issues and the ethical issues. So they drive the way that we conduct research and what we can do about it. Uh, we looked at management and we looked at how management has evolved over the years. So it's not a new idea. It has existed for a long, long, a long time. Uh, and with time, it has changed. So we are now concerned perhaps as researchers about management as a cadre of people versus management as an activity and the role of a manager and the type of management. So we can start questioning and thinking about what we can do in organizational settings now, right? And then we uh, looked at this idea that management research is a bit distinctive than the type of research that takes place in other uh, disciplines, uh, which is, uh, management research is cross-disciplinary, so we could choose to have a singular focus, which is a purely quantitative focus, uh, uh, looking at developing different types of instruments, tools, and techniques, etc. Or we could take a holistic picture of what a manager does in an organizational setting, uh, which is cross-disciplinary. Sure, right? uh, we have to understand that access to data is going to be slightly difficult in management studies as compared to other type of studies because uh, there's uh, politics involved and there's ethical issues involved and there's power issues involved. Right. So having said that, uh, the, the nature of management research um, is, is better to be a structured uh, nature. Uh, where it has shorter interactions, but more clear interactions with your respondents, right? And management research uh, uh, is basically of uh, three types. We can have pure research where we're concerned about developing certain, uh, you know, uh, type of uh, invention or reflections, or we could have. Uh, discoveries, or we could have applied research where we're concerned about uh, applying a particular uh, technique to, uh, to a given problem to sort of uh, mitigate that problem, or we can have action research where we are going to bring about a certain type of work, change in organization, right? So that concludes our lecture. Uh, and uh, I'll, uh, Yeah, so if you have any questions, please feel free to post your questions on the classroom. Uh, and I've also posted some uh, light reading for you. It sort of tallies with what we have discussed in this lecture. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Take care.